Hello everyone. This is a lesson on humanism and this is being presented to you by Pramod Kenayar of the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. In this lesson, we'll be looking at the rise of humanism as a philosophical doctrine and thinking and thought, the problems of European humanism in its history and contemporary critiques and problems of humanism as it translates in the age of technology. Humanism is the study of all aspects of what makes us human. It examines the disciplines, discourses, thinking that constitutes us as human, helps us understand what we are. It also believes that the human is at the center of the universe and is the focus of all intellectual activity. As a result, even divinity is given second position. In the first module, let's first define humanism. Humanism is defined as a form of thought that treats the human as the center of being, consciousness and sense, and human qualities as the key focus of all critical and philosophical studies. Humanist thought is what we refer to as this centering of the human. European humanism traditionally believes that not only is there a universal human, there is also a set of universal human categories, qualities and characteristics. That is, it sees the human as in T capital H capital, the human and not variant models. It sees therefore the human as I just defined it the human as possessing certain characteristics that are common to all parts of the world and all cultures in history. By refusing to see variant models, it creates problems to which we shall turn in a little while. What is so significant about such an idea? The very idea of the universal human leads to the idea of universal human rights, concepts of human dignity, concepts of human care and attributes like the qualities we associate with humans humanity, compassion, caring, pride and so on. That is, humanism traditionally establishes one model of the human and a set of norms as to what constitutes good humans, bad humans or whatever. There are no changes possible. Humanism also thinks of the human as the only rational being, as the one who works with the mind. It sees the human also has a distinct life form separate from other life forms on earth, self-contained, bounded and distinct. It sees, in other words, the human as autonomous. The second module addresses the question of the origins of humanism. The origins of humanism go back to the ancient world. It goes back to the Greek philosophers who declared that man is a measure of all things as Protagoras the Greek declared it. What Protagoras was saying was a traditional and then eventually established humanist belief that man is the center of the world, not God. Therefore, the Greek philosophers rejected the idea of the divine and the supernatural. The Greeks believed that humankind is adequate as a subject of study and humankind controls its own destiny. Buddha, like the Greeks, also rejected the divine role in human interventions. So rather than beliefs in, say, gods or what we now think of as superstitions about myths, traditional ancient humanism believed in human rights over things, human autonomy over things, human rationality over anything else. This also means that humanism originated as a secular, rational, and scientific discipline. Humanism as a philosophical doctrine and form of thought was essentially one that rejected the divine and the supernatural in favor of the human. So whether it was in biology or astronomy, cosmogony or any kind of philosophical tradition, humanism believed that we can treat the human as a center of the world and everything as proceeding from the human rather than from the gods. This was what we can think of as either a secular or a scientific humanist principle. And as a result of it, the focus was almost entirely on discovering more and more things about the human. 
And the, this discovery of more and more things about the human is a characteristic of European Renaissance cultures. The period between the 14th and the 17th century in Europe is generally described as the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the period of new learning, new forms of art, new cultural practices and cultural interactions. It was marked by the flowering of poetry and it is the period of Leonardo da Vinci, Petrarch, Dante Alighieri and Michelangelo. Printing arrives in Europe in the 16th century and there is a greater circulation of books. Artists from Arab and Asian nations visit Europe and there is a major cultural exchange that is underway. Learning as such begins to acquire a key role in all human affairs. This means that the Renaissance built upon culture. It built upon cultural exchange, the exchange of ideas. It also was a period in which new disciplines begin to emerge. It also is the period in which the human begins to be defined in particular ways. For example, when Leonardo da Vinci draws his famous model of Vitruvian man, it's a famous sketch that you will see in practically any textbook these days, um, he was giving the human world a sense of what the human looks like. This is the period of the great anatomy dissections, where for the first time we were able to see what the insides of a human where the component body parts of the human look like. Gabriel Harvey describes the circulation of blood. What do these scientific studies in biology and medicine do? What they achieve is something very important and we nowadays don't pay attention to it because it's so much of a part of our lives. For the first time in human history, in the Renaissance, we could actually see what the human looked like. We could actually visualize it as in the form of a painting, as in the form of a sketch. We were also told what the human contains. The translation of Greek and Latin texts, the availability of these visual texts, all contributed to our knowledge of the human. Then of course there is literature. Let's take the example of the most famous playwright in human language, Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays described human emotions, human behavior, human anxieties, human eccentricities and follies. All of these biology, medicine, scientific research, visual arts, literary arts contributed to our understanding of the human. So what is important for you to understand is humanism as a philosophical doctrine was built upon scientific and literary cultural as well as empirical studies. Humanism evolves because there are more studies of the human. What does a human look like? Biology gives you the answer. How does human body, as in any human body, work? Medicine gives you the answer. How do humans behave? Literature gives you the answer. So you see, what we are talking about is, there are many ways of talking, describing and documenting the human. And the Renaissance is the period where humanism flourishes because there is more knowledge being produced about the human. This is the Renaissance, 14th to 17th century uh, Europe. It's also the period where one particular development is, uh, that happened is something we should all talk about. Because of the rise in humanism as a form of thought, because of the expansion of humanism as a form of thought, the humanities as a discipline also gets established. That is, philosophy, psychology, natural philosophy, medicine, were all subjects of study in universities. Humanities emerges because the human is a subject of study. The next module talks about the next step actually that happens here and that is the progress of European humanism. With the increasing influence of science in the 18th and 19th centuries, the role of religion in defining the human begins to diminish. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, Thomas Paine and others began to speak about the human in almost entirely secular and scientific terms. You would not define the human in religious terms, that God created man, that God created man in certain ways, 
and God enables man to do certain things. Instead, what it began to do was to see human beings as capable of, of evil or good within and in and of themselves. This has a very important consequence. If you take away God from the conversation, then the responsibility for the human is with the human itself. The responsibility for humanity is with humanity itself. You cannot ask the gods to intervene on your behalf. That is, humanism in the progress that we see from the 18th and 19th centuries leaves the decision, the effect, the process of development entirely in human hands. This also means humanism becomes a political debate. Humanism becomes a political matter because how you treat other human beings is not about gods, it's about our humans themselves. Whether we treat them well, whether we treat them badly is not the subject of religion or the priest or the church, but of humans as they are on earth. From this foundation of secular humanism or scientific humanism, we have just mentioned a political consequence. A good example of this consequence would be Thomas Paine's hugely successful and influential book, The Rights of Man, which was a text that inspired the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Um, texts such as Thomas Paine's spoke about human dignity, it spoke about human freedom, and it spoke about human equality. It argued that the function of the government, the function of the state, was to make sure that all humans achieved this sense of dignity, achieved this sense of pride in themselves. It demanded equality. So this meant that the humanist movement began to posit the equality of all human beings. But there is a paradox. When they looked around the world, they discovered that some cultures, some places on earth, did not have human beings who were equal to the others. This is where humanism begins to develop an entirely new shape and form. And that is, from humanist grows the humanitarian movement. The humanitarian movement is a reform movement, is a civilizational movement that begins somewhere towards the last decades of the 18th century. It argued that one of the functions of the superior races on earth is to help serve and improve the lower uh, or deprived or underprivileged or primitive races on earth. That is, this is the paradox of humanism. On the one hand, it said all human beings are equal. But when they looked around the world, they decided and they realized that all human beings are not equal. Then comes the next step. If all human beings are not equal, then it is the duty of the superior human being to help the inferior human being. So humanism, which believed in the equality of all human beings, resulted in humanitarianism, which made, asked for and demanded that the superior human serve, help and civilize the inferior humans. This is the paradox that emerges roughly towards the end of the 18th century. Now, my next module speaks about this paradox manifests in a particular way. That is the link of European humanism with colonialism. Let's look at the point at which I stopped the last module. Humanism shifting into humanitarianism. Humanitarianism was central to the European colonial project. Looking around the world, the Europeans discovered that people in Asia or Africa or South America were not what they saw as advanced. Therefore, it meant that it was the duty of the European to help these people, to make sure that the inferior races were also brought up to the level of the European. European colonial missions were invariably accompanied by the European civilizational or humanitarian mission for this particular reason. The Europeans believed it was their duty to help the so-called lesser races. So, let me quickly give you the two points that we need to see about the European humanist tradition. On the one hand, European humanism assumed the equality of all human beings. When it spoke about the universal human, it believed all human beings were the same anywhere in the world. 
On the other hand, it also assumed the superiority of the European human over, the, say, the African or the Asian human. This sense of superiority drove European colonial projects. How does that happen? If we assume that it is our duty to help the lesser races, then it means we'll have to go out, conquer them and help them improve. There is an intrinsic connection between European humanitarianism and European colonialism. Now, this is very awkward and very odd because colonialism is about power and humanitarianism is about compassion, charity and help. And that's precisely the paradox of European humanism. Humanism on the one hand suggested equality and on the other hand it said we need to help people. You help people by conquering them by having power over them. So you see the irony, the paradox of European humanism is humanism is what enabled the Europeans to conquer other races, other cultures and other countries. This is the paradox that you will see resulting in the horrific slavery of the blacks. It is what results in the conquest of the subcontinent. So the so-called humanist project, the so-called civilizational project was made possible because of colonial empires and the colonial empire was made possible because of the civilizational project. This is the, uh, the, the contradiction at the heart of European humanism where on the one hand it speaks about equality and compassion and on the other hand it argues a case for conquest, domination and power. It is this paradox that creates, in a sense, the crisis of European humanism in the form of the critical humanisms of the 20th century. Critical humanism is the evaluation of humanism for its central paradox or paradoxes. Critical humanism has three significant moments. It questions the assumption that the human is the center of the universe. It questions the so-called rationality of the human mind. And it questions how when European humanism speaks about universality or the universal human, it excluded the Jews, the blacks, the women and the slaves from the very category of the human. So for instance, critical humanism argues that humanism was not inclusive. Humanism defines the human as a center by excluding certain people, by excluding certain races, classes and ethnic groups. Feminists, for example, argued that humanism was essentially going to make a case for the male as the standard human. Feminists argued that for humanism, the only subject, the only human subject is a male human. There is no female category at all, except as an absence, except as a lack, except as a negativity. That is, humanism excluded other genders, other bodies, other kinds of people, races and ethnic identities from the category of the human. Freud destroyed humanist ideas about the rational being by showing how most of the human mind is uncontrollable because it's unconscious. Freud destroyed the idea of the rational autonomous human being by showing how human beings are irrational, dependent, unconsciously governed by certain desires and stories. It therefore rejected the myth of humanism as of the standardized autonomous human individual. Finally, within critical humanism, the post-colonial and race studies strand showed how Humanism had always worked by excluding certain races. In other words, there is no such thing as a universal human. The universal human in critical humanism's evaluation of it has always been the white male human. This is important. It's important because contrary to our general notion of European humanism as a very democratic, very inclusive, very catch-all category of the human, the universal human, Humanism has been revealed to be exclusionary. It has been revealed to be unjust and unfair because it has excluded several races, ethnic groups, women from the definition of the human itself. Let me go back quickly to a point I made in the previous module to illustrate this.
How was it that European humanists were able to tolerate and in fact encourage slavery? I talked about slavery briefly before. You see, the blacks were not deemed to be humans at all. Therefore, you could treat them like animals. What the critical humanists do is to recognize and acknowledge the fact that humanism worked through exclusion, not inclusion. It defined certain races as non-human. It defined certain categories of people as less than human. And as a result, they could do anything with these people. So the blacks who were treated as mere animals, non-humans, could be shipped as slaves. They could be beaten, tortured and killed. They could be treated very badly. They could be exterminated individually or collectively. You see, if humanism believed that all humans were equal, it also believed that some races were not human at all. And you cannot give human dignity to an animal. So if you said the black was an animal, then it meant the European does not have to give human rights to the black man or the black woman. I hope you recognize the paradox of humanism here. And this is the central problem with humanism in general, that at some point humanism begins to be an exclusionary category where several categories of people, ethnic identities and groups are not seen or deemed to be humans at all. Race studies and postcolonialism uh, is firmly situated within the critical humanist tradition. Feminism is firmly situated in the critical humanist tradition. Several of us here would be familiar with films like Terminator or The Matrix trilogy, in which humans and machines live together. Humans are partly machines and machines are partly humans. Films about robots, films about sci which are science fictional in nature, often show humans with body parts that are machines or body parts that are animal. Man and the machine come together in the age of the 20th century and the early 21st century, and this is the age of posthumanism. To understand posthumanism, you need to go back a little bit to humanist ideas. Remember, I defined the human in traditional humanism as a self contained, bounded, and autonomous identity or entity. Posthumanism believes that this is wrong. Posthumanism argues that humans have always evolved with technology. Posthumanism believes that humans have always co-evolved with other creatures. Let's take an example. There are 10 raised to power 14 bacteria in our stomach that helps us digest food. If we think of the humans as autonomous self-contained entities, how can we explain the fact that we can only survive because we are helped by bacteria to survive? If there is no bacteria, we cannot stay human anymore. This means there is a paradox again that what we think of as a self-contained, very limited, very clearly distinguishable human is actually the result of co-evolution. It, it is the result of a collaboration between the human and other forms of life and technology as well. That is, post-humanism argues a major case for seeing the human as something that has to be opened up to, has to be seen in conjunction with other forms of life. Posthumanism emerges in the 1990s and is a philosophical, political and cultural approach that changes the question of the human in the age of technological modification. It sees human abilities and human consciousness as dependent upon other forms of life. It sees the human as having evolved along with other forms of life. It does not see autonomous humans. It does not see self-contained bounded humans. Instead, it sees the human as a series of connections and crossings across plant and animal life. Posthumanism is a very important movement now because it borrows from consciousness studies, computer science and artificial intelligence studies and animal studies. Posthumanism is important and I will go back briefly to the critical humanist one for you to understand this better. Remember what we have said, critical humanism notes the paradox of humanism that it excludes rather than includes. That it is exclusionary because it treats some people as less than human. Now what posthumanism does is to show that there is no such thing as an I. There is no such thing as the human because the human is actually 
something that is connected with other forms of life, plant, animal and machine. You cannot think of the human as this unique identity or entity and then there is another other form of life or other forms of life. It sees the human as something that is constantly connected with movements and dynamic relations across other forms of life and the living world. Posthumanism therefore calls upon the humanists to revise their idea of the human. This is the posthumanist strand of the 20th and the early 21st century. Let me now reiterate the key points of humanism once again. Humanism evolved in the ancient world and argued for the first time that humans must be treated as the center of the world. It believed that rather than depend upon gods, rather than argue for the power of the gods over humans, we need to see the humans as masters of their own destiny. It saw the man as a measure of all things and saw man as universal. So it began to speak of the human as though there is only one model, non-variant, non-variable. Humanism expands considerably and at a very rapid pace during the European Renaissance. This occurs because of new forms of learning, new forms of the visual arts, new literature, which starts talking about the human in certain ways. There are visual representations of the human. There are descriptions of human follies. There are fictional representations of the human, and I use Shakespeare as a, as a case study there. It drew figures of the human, Da Vinci, also mentioned in the early part of what I was speaking about, all of which contributed to a better understanding of the human. And the Renaissance, 14th to the 17th century in Europe, is where humanism really gathers force. As the century progresses into the 18th and the 19th century, humanism begins to develop new forms. The first one is when it begins to see the duty of the upper, more powerful, privileged sections of humanity as a race and its duty towards the lesser ones. That is, humanism begins to modulate into humanitarianism where it becomes the duty of the more privileged, the superior races to help civilize and improve the lesser races. The second development that occurs here is that we have to recognize this as a historical moment, so you need to pay uh, some attention to this, that humanity is divided into the superior and the inferior races, although humanism spoke about the equality of all man. Now, if it is the duty of the superior races to help the inferior ones, it means they require control over the inferior ones. And that brings us to the paradox within humanism, that humanism works only when the upper sections of the society or human race has power over the other, over the lower, over the less privileged. So European humanism's paradox that emerges in the 18th and the 19th century is on the one hand it spoke about the equality of mankind and on the other it also posited a hierarchy of races and it said that the more privileged the superior races must help the less privileged ones. This also was a moment at which colonialism emerges that the Helping out of the inferior races, the civilizational process of the lower races can be achieved only when you have conquest and power and domination over them. In the 20th century, much of this paradox has been explored within the critical humanist strand, feminism, Freudian psychoanalysis and posthumanism. Thank you.